36 through 49 in NIV version. Starting out just a little bit earlier than that. Now Jesus was walking down the road and he was talking to the two people that didn't recognize him after he'd risen from the, from the dead. After he left them, they returned to Jerusalem and went and found the eleven and gathered and assembled with the eleven in, I assume, the upper room. Now I'm starting on 36. Now while they were still talking about this episode, Jesus appeared and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that Jesus was a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled and why do you doubt about why do you doubt excuse me, why does doubt raise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and blood as you see I have. Now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, and while they were still Looking, they did not believe because they had joy in their heart and, and they were amazed as, as he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of boiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they understood the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and raise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. And I'm going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. If you're visiting with us again, we're glad that you're here. And give us a chance to meet you and get to know you a little bit better uh, once our services have concluded. Uh, Neil Kamenowski called me this morning, fellas, and he said, hey, Monday Night Football is going to be getting together up in the team room tomorrow night. It's a battle of the birds uh, tomorrow night. You got the Falcons and the Eagles, and I'll be honest with you, I have no clue whether either one of them is any good this year. Uh, so it might be a battle of the really bad birds. I have no idea. Uh, but if you're getting together with your brothers in Christ and invite your friends, it's, it's a good time. So I want to encourage you to do that as well. I want to encourage our teens, if you haven't taken a look at the bulletin board in the foyer, there are some new things up there that you can sign up for. Uh, so be sure to, to, to check that out. Uh, you'll want to be a part of that. And you certainly want to invite your friends uh, to be a part of it as well. Yesterday, we had a service project, uh, the, the, the youth group and, and some of our, of our members. We went out and visited some, some folks that uh, could use a visit, encouraged by a visit, uh, and it was a fantastic time. We got to sit down and get to know uh, some folks that aren't able to always be with us. Uh, here uh, in the auditorium to be present with us and and had a great time. We got together at Brahms afterwards and talked about our visit. About 15 of us, uh, we broke up into into five groups and went and visited some folks. and And I'd just like to give a shout out to Linda Rose if you're watching online. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed visiting with you and and Sue Godsey. We visited with Sue and uh, just had a wonderful visit with her as well. So this is something that we're going to. Uh, continue uh, in the future because I think everybody got something good out of that. A lot of good things going on uh, here at the Mesquite Church of Christ. Um, we pick up this morning, uh, and I would love to be, as they say, a fly on the wall when all of this is going on. If you remember last week, we talked about these two guys, that uh, Cleopas and his friend, and they're walking back uh, to Emmaus after all of the events over the Passover weekend in Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus had been crucified three days earlier. A lot of things were going on on that first day of the week. And so if you remember, they were walking back to Emmaus, and they were talking about everything that had been going on, and this guy that they didn't recognize just walks up and starts talking with them. Ask them what they're talking about, and these events that you're talking about, what's going on? And they just cannot believe, they're wondering what rock has this guy been hiding under that he doesn't know about what's going on. 
And then Jesus begins to talk to them about how, how he, how the Messiah was to fulfill all of the scriptures and to fulfill all righteousness. And he gave them a Ph.D. level course in Bibliology and Christology all the way back to Emmaus. Well, they invited him to stay the night because it was getting dark. It's getting late. You don't want to travel during this time after dark. And so they come in and they sit down at the table and Jesus takes the lead role at the table, which is not the norm. Usually invited to do that. Bible doesn't say that he was. He takes the lead and he breaks the bread and he blesses it. And the Bible says, Luke records, that their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he went on. Well, those guys got up and they hightailed it back to Jerusalem. They double timed, okay? They're heading back. And when we pick up in the scripture this morning, they have just come in, they're panting, they're out of breath, and they're telling the 11 and the others that had gathered with them what's going on, and that's where we pick up in our text today. And so before we get into the message this morning, let's go to God in prayer together. Lord, we thank you so much for the beauty of this day and the, the peacefulness of this hour that we can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and remember Jesus, what you've done for us. That's, what, that, that's why we're here. That's what brings us together. And it doesn't matter whether there's 300 of us or three of us. Where two or more are gathered, you're there. And you're with us all, always. We thank you for that. Spirit, I pray that this message is your message this morning, that you will speak in a very powerful way to our hearts and our minds so that we may understand what it means that Jesus is risen, that Jesus is present in our life, and that he is accounted for in the Scriptures. Lord, we love you so much, and we praise you for all that you've done for us, and we give you thanks for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we pick up the text this morning that Don shared with us just a moment ago, Cleopas and his friend, they've just returned to Jerusalem. I mean, they just made the round trip. They just returned to Jerusalem, and they're telling the 11 what happened as they were traveling to Emmaus. And they're excited about it. They're excited. They're out of breath. They can't get the words out fast enough. Have you ever had something like that that you just wanted to share with somebody and you, you're just trying to get it out and you can't get it out? You're trying and, and it just won't come out fast enough. A lot of us who have children, we understand that when they want to tell on their brother or sister, right? They just can't get it out fast enough. That's where these guys are. And then we see Luke write in chapter 24, verse 36. Again, picture this in your mind. Cleopas and friends have just come in. They're, they're panting. They're breathing hard. They're trying to get this out. We had this conversation with this guy. We, we didn't know who he was. And then we get back to the house, and, and we sit down to eat, and bam, it's Jesus. And just about that time, when all this is going on, Luke writes, now while they were telling these things, I mean, they're in the middle of it. Mid-sentence, Jesus himself suddenly stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now, I don't know about you, but that would freak me out. I mean, totally. And this is what's going on. Now, I suspect when that happened, you could have heard a pin drop in that room. I mean, not even Cleopas and his friend are breathing hard right now. I suspect that they're holding their breath because it's dead quiet. Verse 37 says, But they were startled and frightened and thought they were looking at a spirit. Now take a good look at that. Now I find that interesting. And the reason why I find that interesting is since Cleopas and his friend are explaining that they've not only just seen Jesus alive, but they had an extensive conversation with him about the scriptures all the way to Emmaus. And they also reported, if you remember, that Peter had seen Jesus before anyone else did. And yet Luke writes right there, 
that they're all startled. They're all frightened. And they thought they were looking at a spirit. Even though Cleopas and his friend and Peter all knew better. You find that interesting? Jesus sees their response. He sees the reaction that his appearance suddenly coming through the door, through the wall, whatever, not by traditional normal means, has presented in this room full of people. He sees their response and then he moves very quickly to reassure them that he is in fact alive. He's alive. <coughs> Excuse me. And he's standing resurrected in their presence. We pick up in verses 38 to 43. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why are doubts arising in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself touch me and see, because a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you plainly see that I have. Again, if you're a fly on the wall witnessing all of this, this has got to be somewhat hilarious. Okay? Jesus said, well, hold up, guys. What, what, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Can't you see? I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. You can't see through me. I have skin. I have flesh. I have bones. A ghost doesn't have those things. But I do. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it, because of their joy and astonishment, he said to them, You got anything to eat? I'm hungry. You have anything to eat? They served him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in front of them. Now take a look at that. Look at what's going on there. Try to absorb all of that. Jesus doesn't scold them for their doubt. Think about it. Think about these guys. Think about what these guys have been through. Think about it. They are physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted. Now remember something. This is late at night, and we're still on the day of His resurrection. All of this has taken place in one day. We're still on the day of His resurrection, just three days after His crucifixion. These people are frazzled. And rather than criticize them, as Jesus very easily could have done, rather than criticize them, Jesus understands. And Jesus does what needs to be done to bring them up to speed with what's going on and to give them the tangible evidence that they need to believe. Which, if you remember, one week later, he's got to do it all over again for who? Thomas. Now, in order to convince them that their eyes and their ears are not deceiving them, Jesus had them do a few things. First, Jesus, Jesus had them trust their eyes. He said, trust what you're seeing. He had them trust their eyes and look at the distinctive marks on his hands and his feet. In other words, look for what you know. In the first part of verse 39, Jesus says to them, see my hands and my feet that it is I myself. The guy that was hung on the cross just three days ago, I'm that guy. Your eyes are not deceiving you. Trust what I'm saying. Trust what you're seeing and hearing. Family, in that statement, Jesus is saying, trust your eyes. For what you are seeing is truly me. But you know what? Sometimes our eyes can deceive us. Anybody ever seen a mirage before? Spend some time out in the Arizona desert, you'll see some things that you think might be there, but they're just not there. Jesus is saying to them, trust what you're seeing. You can trust what you're seeing. But you know what? That's hard for us as people, isn't it? Because we know that sometimes our eyes can deceive us, like a mirage or a smoke and mirrors a magic trick, and other things that we think are there, but they're really not. So then Jesus has them trust their hands. Not only trust what you're seeing, trust your hands to feel the wounds that they all were familiar with. 
They were there. They saw Jesus nailed to the cross. Trust your hands and touch my hands. Touch the wounds. Touch the scars. And feel what you know to be true to confirm what your eyes are seeing. Family, we read this right here in the second half of verse 39. He says, Touch me and see, because the Spirit does not have flesh and bones as you plainly see that I have. In other words, if you don't trust your eyes for what you see, then trust your hands for what you feel. It's said that the 17th century theologian Thomas Fuller coined this very familiar phrase, seeing is believing, but feeling is the truth. Seeing is believing, but feeling is the truth. Family, Jesus understands their need. He understands their need to have proof in order to believe in his resurrection. He provides it for them. He gives them exactly what they need. And by the way, he gives us what we need. He gives them what they need. And Luke further records in verse 41 that while they still could not believe it because of their joy and astonishment, he says, you got anything to eat? Kind of hungry. Have you anything to eat? Take a good look at that. While they're trying to process everything else that's going on, This ghost that we think might be a ghost, or maybe not, or might be a spirit, or maybe not, is hungry. Family, the third point here is obvious. Spirits don't get hungry, and ghosts don't ask for something to eat. This doesn't happen. Verses 42 and 43 says, They served him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in front of them. Now take a good look at that, what Luke records right there, because it's important. Notice that Luke doesn't simply say they gave him a piece of fish and he ate it. He specifically says they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it in front of them. That's important. That's an important detail that we need not miss. And the reason why it's an important detail is that Jesus is making a very, very important point to all gathered in that room. He's making the point, church, that he is fully resurrected from the dead. Now, I'm going to diverge to a little rabbit trail. What do we consider the resurrection to look like? How many of us or how many people that we know think that we're just all going to be transparent spirits floating around in the hereafter? We don't think about it a whole lot, but I'll be honest with you, popular opinion is that's exactly what it's going to look like. Jesus is sharing with us, Luke is recording for us what the resurrection looks like. Physical, tangible, recognizable. Jesus may or may not have been hungry, but he could eat a piece of fish. The Bible says that when we're resurrected, we will be like him. You ever stop and think about that? I think about weird things. I'm not going to ask for a piece of broiled fish. I'm going to ask for an eternal bag of Reese cups. <laughs> and guess who is not going to gain an ounce? Not me. Physical laws such as that don't apply. I mean, these are things that that we, we read, but do we process them? Do we think about what the resurrected body is going to be like? Jesus is displaying it for us right here. And he does it in this case to prove that he is alive. He's resurrected. These things were intended to give the tangible proof family that they needed to accept the fact that Jesus is standing alive right in front of them. He is alive, but he's also different. He's resurrected. His body bears the markings of recognition that they should see and and feel and recognize. But now, family, if you notice, he has the ability that transcends the known laws of physics. How did Jesus enter the room? He didn't turn the doorknob and he didn't walk through the door. 
he now has the ability with a physical, tangible body to come and go into a locked room and then disappear. Now, are we going to get that? I don't know. I'd like to find out. Church, there's three things to take note of here. First, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the foundation of the Christian faith. Just understand something very clearly right now, church. Without the resurrection, we are wasting our time here together this morning. Without the resurrection, our faith is a waste of time. We're totally and completely without hope in this world. And I don't know if you've been checking it out lately, but we need hope in this world. We need hope in this world. And that's what the resurrection gives us. Second, we need to examine and revisit the evidence of the resurrection. We need to come back to it over and over and over again. We can't expect ourselves and church, we can't expect others to just accept the resurrection of the dead at face value. It's not good enough to say, well, because I say so. Mm -mm. We got to do better than that. For a lot of people, their response to the resurrection is this. Well, in order for me to believe in the resurrection, Jesus is going to have to appear before me and before the eleven and before Thomas, just like like he appeared before them. In other words, seeing is believing, feeling is the truth. A lot of people in this day and time, that's their reaction. And I understand it. I get it. And yet these same people... Same people fully subscribe to other things as being historical fact. That they themselves have never seen before, but they believe that it is a matter of historical faith. Things such as the sinking of the Titanic, the Civil War, the existence of George Washington. September 11th. There are people in this room that weren't alive when September the 11th happened, but they believe that it happened. And other events that are fully accepted, fully accepted as historically accurate. Was anybody in this room alive when George Washington was living? I don't think so. Was anybody in this room alive when the Titanic went down? No. But we accept that as historical fact, do we not? Here's the thing. What these folks fail to accept, church, is the fact that the biblical record is also a part of the historical record. And the evidence of its authenticity, church, is being confirmed more and more every single day. And family, here's the deal. It's that faith part that's hard, isn't it? It's hard because 2 plus 2 equals 4 does not apply to faith. It doesn't apply there. And the Hebrew writer points this out in chapter 11, verse 1. He says, now faith is the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. Take a good look at that. He's saying there's some things that exist that you can't see. There's some things that exist that you can't tangibly feel. It doesn't mean that they're not there. That's what faith is. Faith is being sure of the things hoped for and certain of the things not seen. Now understand that the statement that that the Hebrew writer makes right there about faith in Jesus is just as applicable to George Washington, or any other historical figure. Because there's no one alive today who has seen either one of them. But we have historical testimony from witnesses that saw both Jesus alive and raised from the dead after his crucifixion, and we have historical references to prove that George Washington existed and lived on this earth and their accomplishments. But we'll accept one and totally deny the other one. 
That doesn't make sense. We have the biblical record containing the testimony of the eyewitnesses, which Paul would later point out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 6. Listen to what he says. He says, For what I handed down to you is of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, which is the Aramaic name for Peter, then to the twelve, and after He appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom who remain until now. Take a good look at what he's saying. Jesus appeared to all these people. He appeared to 500 folks all at one time. And guess what? A lot of those folks are still living. Go ask them. If you don't believe me, go ask them. Now, Paul is putting himself out there during this time, saying and laying out the possibility that, you, okay, fine, I'll go ask one of those people. Give me their name and address. And then they could say, I don't, know what, I don't know what Paul's talking about. He could have been disproven. He knew that he wouldn't be disproven because he knew that it was historical fact. And there were witnesses that would back it up. Church, the evidence of the resurrection is there. It's there. Just as much so as any other historical fact. But some choose not to believe in Jesus. And some choose not to believe in the resurrection. And that's their free will choice to do so. For example, there's some things that are confirmed historical fact that some people just don't believe in. Like the moon landing. There are people out there that say that happened on a sage out in California somewhere, on a set somewhere. Nobody ever landed on the moon. Some people believe that. Some people believe it actually happened. Some don't. There's a lot of people, unfortunately, who don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Third, we need to be patient with others, just as Jesus was patient with the disciples. Family, we need to understand that a part of being patient with others means that we don't need to be intimidated by the questions they ask. And the fact of the matter is that if we are intimidated by the questions others ask about our faith, family, then what that means is that we're not prepared to answer with the information that we should know. And if we are asked a question, and if we don't have an answer, then we don't need to be afraid to say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that question. Just because we don't have the answer, church, that we can immediately call up, doesn't mean that there is no answer. What it means is that we need to study more. And also what that means is that we've just been given an opportunity to sit down and to study together with the people who have those questions and find the answers together. Family, if people are asking with an open mind, then that is time well shared. From what Luke records, it appears that the eleven did examine the evidence by looking at the hands and looking at the feet of Jesus, by reaching out and touching the scars on his hands and on his side, and by giving him something to eat just like he asked for. They examined the evidence. But notice what the verse, first half of verse 41 says. It says they still could not believe it because of their joy and astonishment. Now take a good look at that. In effect, what Luke is saying there is that they can't wrap their heads around what they're seeing. They can't comprehend what they are now touching. And it's not that they don't, they don't necessarily believe in it. It's that their mind hasn't caught up with their senses. Their mind's in shock. And the connection between their mind and their senses has been broken. They, they haven't made that connection yet. And so here's the thing. How many of us have witnessed something, okay, and responded to it with this statement? Man, I can't believe what just happened. Anybody ever said that before after seeing something? Or am I the only one? Man, I can't believe that just happened. This is where the 11 are. That's exactly where they're sitting right now. And so we pick up the text in verses 44 to 47. 
Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things that are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, So it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Now look at what Jesus says there. Family, Jesus reminds them of some things that we need to take note of. First, we need to understand that he wants us to come to a knowledge of the truth. Church, faith is not limited to experience alone. A lot of people believe that it is. But faith is not limited to experience alone. Church, the mind has to be an integral part of faith in order for it to be lasting and in order for it to make sense. Think about it. These guys have just had an incredible experience. Now Jesus wants to reinforce that experience with foundational truth. Jesus wants the 11, and he wants you he want, and me, he wants us to understand that spiritual experience must be evaluated by biblical truth. Let me repeat that. Family, spiritual experience must be evaluated by biblical truth. And so Jesus shows them the truth. He opens their mind. And he shows them the truth and his fulfillment of the Scriptures according to the law, according to the prophets, and according to the Psalms. He brings it all together. Second, Jesus reminds them that God is the source of spiritual truth. Later, we're going to see this point confirmed by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. He writes, A natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit, of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Take a good look at what he says there. That's true. Now, in order to understand the things of God, church, we have to be willing to go to the source in order to be instructed. I don't mind telling you, trigonometry is Greek to me. I don't understand it. I can look at a trig problem sideways, upside down. It makes no sense to me. I can't tell you which side is up on a trig problem. I don't get it. I don't understand it. It is completely, totally Greek to me. I don't get it. I don't understand it. And the thing about it is, unless I have someone to show me and to open my mind... There is no hope that Devin is ever going to figure that out. But with the help of an instructor church and a desire to learn, that's the key. A desire to learn. It is possible for anyone to learn trigonometry. Even me. This is what Jesus does for the 11. And this is what the Spirit does for us. When we're willing to open our mind and open our heart to learn. Notice verse 47. Jesus says something that we may or may not have caught right off. Luke records him saying that, quote, repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. All the nations. Beginning from Jerusalem. Now notice something. Notice that Luke records that for Theophilus, he, he notes this in the past tense. Okay? In other words, that it's already happening. Repentance for sins is going out to all nations. It's already happening and, family, in a sense, it's happening in this letter between Luke and Theophilus. Church, the gospel of Jesus, written by Luke to Theophilus, a Gentile, who would be included in that statement as being a part of all the nations. Verses 48 and 49, Jesus gives instructions. 
And he gives these instructions primarily to the remaining apostles, but his instructions also apply to each and every one of us as well. Listen to what he says. He says, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now look at what Jesus says there. First, Jesus says, you are witnesses of these things. Well, what things? What have they been witnesses to? They've been witnesses to his life. They've been witnesses to his teaching. They've been witnesses to his death, to his burial, and now witnesses of his resurrection. And family, these are the foundational elements of faith. The word there that translates as witness is our, in our English Bible is the Greek word martus. Now what does that sound like, martus? It's the English word martyr. It's the root for our English word martyr. Family, this not only tells the apostles and us what we are, church, but what we've been called to do. We are to be martyrs, and we are to martyr ourselves, if need be, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. This gives us identity, and it gives us purpose. Second, Jesus says that he's sending the promise of the Father upon them, which he also has sent upon us as believers. And we see this in Acts chapter 2, in the gift of the Holy Spirit. In effect, family, what's going on here is they try to wrap their heads around what they're seeing, what they're dealing with, and wrap their heads around the fact that they have been called to testify, even die, if necessary, for the gospel. Jesus tells them, hey, help's on the way. Help is on the way. And again, they're trying to figure it all out. It's coming way, way, way too fast. They're, just, they're trying to get a grip on all of this, trying to get a grip on their new identity, on their new purpose, on the expectation of the price in their life that they may be called to pay for the gospel, that some of them, most of them, in fact, all of them, with the exception of John, are going to die as martyrs for the gospel. There's one question in their mind right now. What's this promise all about? Jesus says, stay in the city until you're clothed with power on high. This is a promise that he's talking about. Stay in the city and wait. We have a term for that in the military. It's called hurry up and wait. You get sick and tired of hearing that. But you deal with it all the time. This is what Jesus is telling them. Hey, hurry up and wait. Helps on the way. Family, that word for power, the power that they're to wait for, that word for power comes from the Greek word dunamis. And in our English, that word is where we get the word dynamite from. Stay in the city until you're clothed with power, with dunamis, with dynamite from on high. Power. Explosive power. And family, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is risen from the dead. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is present in this room, in our life. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is accounted for right here in the Scriptures. Family, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus calls us to a new and powerful life. He tells the eleven in this passage today, and He tells you and me, right now if we trust obey and wait we will have power explosive power from the lord church these guys felt powerless absolutely powerless just like many of us do in our life with the things that we're struggling with and here's a question 
Are you willing to trust and obey the Lord for the power that He has promised you? It's not a matter of if the power is available to you. It's the reality that it is. And whether or not you're going to choose it. That's really what it's all about. As long as you trust the Lord, there's hope. As long as you put your faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and His ability to resurrect you through the Holy Spirit when you trust Him and you obey Him and you confess Him as the Lord of your life, and you subject yourself to die to yourself and live for Him through immersion, you will have the power of the Holy Spirit come to indwell you, to guide you, to lead you, to comfort you, to give you the power that you need to live this life today until the next one comes. So whatever you need this morning, take advantage of this opportunity to come to Jesus, to give Him your life, to lay your concerns at His feet, to receive that power of the Holy Spirit to trust and obey Him while we stand and sing.